dinner time. Not without the farm. Not without water. Fertile ground. Or machines to plow it. Not without safekeeping. Distribution. And a top up every now and then. Not without the wholesaler. The retailer. Or the bank that backs the mall. Dinner time. Not without business. Stand it back. It can be. SME Summit 2022. I'm MCZ James. And as I said that I expected some clapping just to give me some... Uh, so No, no, no. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We'll do it again. Because me, I need as much confidence as the rest of you for today. So, um, welcome. My name is MCZ James. Oh, we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Like I said, my name's MCZ James, and I'm your host today. I'm so honored to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm a radio presenter. I don't know why I'm standing here. I feel like I'm a youth pastor behind this thing, eh? No, 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 no. I'm a radio presenter, and I currently work at 947. I do the mid-morning show from 9 until 12. It is not lost on me that right now it is mid-morning. So, a um, bit of an awkward situation. My bosses think I'm at home with a migraine. Let me quickly speak to the guys online, because most of you are watching online. Don't snitch. I know you guys. I know you're going to tweet and tag and hash and whatever it may be. Please don't snitch. My boss really thinks I'm at home with a migraine. So let's just keep it here with us. I am joking, man. They're very much well aware where I am. And talk about hashtagging. Make sure you get involved in the conversation online. Uh, there's a couple of guys in here who are actually just here to give me confidence and make me feel like I'm not losing my mind talking to cameras all day. But I know that vast majority of you guys are watching from at home or wherever you may be in the office. So make sure that you get involved in the conversation. There is a chat box for you guys to chat on, but also online, just use hashtag Standard Bank SME Summit uh, and we can uh, engage further on that. So. Like I said, uh, I'm so excited that I was asked to do this, but like most of you sitting out there today and probably in this room, you wondered, why him? Why did they ask him? What? What's going on? Why would they ask him to do that? I did some research to find out why, because I was also like, what the heck is going on? Turns out, Mops is out of the country. So Mops Maponyan is actually in Antarctica at the moment, doing whatever he does with the penguins up there. Then I realized that Sivan Gezi, his problem is that flights from Cape Town, we know. It's, it's, it's a lot going on, you know, there's no Kulula and all of that, so he couldn't make it. Turns out, um, Kat Maboa, he's working again, so he's got a gig, a steady gig again, and I was option number four. In case you're wondering, option number five was, that was Lunga Shabalala, but hey, we're here now, you're stuck with me. I, uh, apart from being on radio and all the media stuff that I do, I also am a budding entrepreneur myself. Um, in uh, other words, I am struggling, I'm broke all the time. That's what I mean. <laughs> I'm joking. I am a budding entrepreneur. We've got several businesses that my wife and I run. And so I was honored to be a uh, part of this just because I, I'm excited for some of the keynote addresses we'll have and some of the panel discussions that are going to be happening today just for my own personal reasons, just to get some of that wealth of knowledge and just learning. I always say one of my favorite sayings in the whole world is that smart people learn from their mistakes but wise people learn from the mistakes of others. So hopefully today, we can hear some of those mistakes that people have made along the way so we don't make the same mistakes and also learn and grow from those things. I think by the end of today, we'll leave very encouraged, uh, enthusiastic about the future, a way forward for SMEs. And um, yeah, just once again, I just want to thank Standard Bank for continuing to support this summit and continuing to support SMEs. I was telling some ladies outside just now that our first business loan to start one of our businesses was uh, with Standard Bank. So I mean, I'm very much well aware of some of the support that comes with being one of your clients. So just a round of applause for our title sponsor, hey? Yeah. Also, shout out to Business Day. Shout out to you guys too. Haven't forgotten about that. Um, a lot going on today. I promise you it's not going to be one of those long, draining days where you just hear yeah, people ramble on and on. I've asked them to keep it very short, so anything below 10 hours, we all should be happy um, uh, to, to, to be here today. Uh, before we get started with our first keynote address, I just want to welcome on stage uh, to give us uh, official welcome from our sponsor, Nale Mosomane, who's the Head of Enterprise Development for Standard Bank. Good 
Good morning, everyone. Can I have more spirit? Morning, guys. <laughs> um, thank you so much for taking time to attend our Standard Bank SME Summit. I am Ngadadzani Musumani, and I head up enterprise development at Standard Bank's business and commercial clients division. Our purpose at Standard Bank is to drive Africa's growth at business and commercial clients. This purpose finds its expression in partnering with Africa's businesses to drive their growth. As a group, we operate in 15 con uh, countries across the continent, and in South Africa, we partner with more than 400,000 small, medium, and larger businesses. Working with these businesses across our economy especially at those moments that matter for their growth, has taught us that businesses need a partner who is willing to walk the journey with them, take time to understand their vision, and provide them with the appropriate financial and non-financial solutions to recognize and enable opportunities so their businesses can thrive. At Standard Bank, we understand that enterprises face a myriad of challenges ranging from a lack of access to finance, skills, markets, and resources. These challenges are enterprise and industry agnostic. Our extensive business banking experience allows us to assist in strengthening businesses so that they can succeed. Standard Bank has a range of banking and beyond banking solutions aimed at supporting all types of businesses from startups to those that are established. Our servicing model is anchored in building relationships with our clients so that we can proactively service them. We have created our Enterprise Direct model, which is a virtual capability where all our business banking clients, regardless of their turnover, size, and location, are able to access a team of bankers and specialists who can proactively address their needs. Through Enterprise Direct, our team of bankers and specialists can engage the client, understand the need, and match them with the right set of banking solutions. As a business bank, we also have a strong focus on what we call our beyond banking solutions. Access to skills, resources, and markets is critical for the success of any business. We have therefore been deliberate in building and creating a range of non-banking solutions that aim to strengthen enterprises. The Standard Bank SME Summit is one of the ways that we believe that we can support businesses beyond banking. The content and knowledge that will be shared throughout the summit will improve your abilities as entrepreneurs, shape your thinking, and help you identify new opportunities that will take your business to new heights. Our other Beyond Banking solutions can also be found on our BizConnect portal, which is our free resource hub, where you can get access to templates, articles, and industry information, <coughs> as well as thought leadership. This program really excites me because I truly believe that it will empower you, challenge you, shape your thinking, and help you change your dreams into tangible outputs. We have great speakers and industry experts. We also have real successful entrepreneurs who have walked the startup journey and will really inspire you to have the courage to push beyond your internal boundaries. So please enjoy the next few sessions. Take time to reflect on the learnings that come from the event. And above all else, never forget that all of you play an important role in improving the quality of life for your families, your employees, and the broader communities and economy in which you operate, touching and advancing the lives of countless people you may never meet. Thank you. Amazing, thank you, thank you so much.
All right, I forgot to do some house rules. I told you guys you should have hired Mubs all along. Anyway, listen, the only rules today is just make sure that you keep getting engaged, having fun, uh, refreshments you can grab outside. And then, of course, the bathrooms, if you're in the building, uh, as you came in, you would have seen the lifts there. Ladies on the right, gents on the left. If you're at home, you know exactly where your bathrooms are. Let's get on with it. Our first keynote address today, I'm really excited about because... We're always looking towards the future, how the world of work has changed. I mean, it's changed so drastically in the last two years for obvious reasons, and it's continuing to change, you know. Every day something happens that really shifts the way that we think about the landscape of the work environment and how it will continue to shift too. So by the end of this session, we should have a bit more of an understanding of how a lot of that change is going to happen. So let me welcome on stage now somebody who is a, didn't know these titles existed or these type of jobs existed. She's a futurist. Which to me is like, that's crazy, because how do you know? What's the, what does that mean? An economist, a business trends analyst from Flux Trends. Her name is Bronwyn Williams. Let's welcome her on stage. Well, to sort of explain what we do, uh, as I like to say, I'm trained as an economist, but I work as a futurist, and economists do try and predict the future, but futurists don't. We instead try and open your minds as to what could happen in the future and perhaps what should or should not happen too. But anyway, today I'm going to be talking to you about the future of work and specifically about how people are working within your organizations because what has become critically important to all of us over the last few years is that all value, whether it's in the metaverse or whether it's in the real world or whether it's in our workplaces, really comes from our human relationships, the relationships we have with our teams and our staff in-house, and also the relationships that we have with our customers. So just to cast our minds back a little bit, because I'm going to be doing a bit of context as to what's happened and changed in the world of work, from today, looking back into the sort of pre-COVID times that most of us can barely even remember at this point in time, because as they say, what is normal anyway? Normal is sort of the average of yesterday, last week, and last month, so it's a constantly shifting dynamic. But I think, again, this whole point of people are at the cause of everything and all the major shifts and trends that we're seeing in the world. And if we do cast our minds back and we can remember what life was like before we went into those COVID lockdowns in 2020, we could see that the world was already starting to shift. And what I have here is a collection of mass protest images from across the world that took place before COVID lockdowns took place. And these were sort of symptomatic of the fact that society wasn't necessarily working for all of us right now. We seem to think that our own insurrection that we had during the middle of COVID, it kind of makes us think that that happened because of COVID, because of what was happening in the world of health and all of that. But really, it was talking to the fact that there were deeper issues in society and that people were not necessarily happy with the status quo. And of course, that just continues on as to what's happened over the last two years. And as we know, what has happened with COVID from an economic perspective has largely been almost a kind of very unfair sorting and sifting of society, which is only really exacerbating those winds of change and those large mass movements, and this great sense of disrest and distrust that's going on in the world right now. And this image is an image that an illustrator put together of the so-called K-shaped recovery that we've seen. In that on the one hand, if you go right here, in, very close to us in Sanson, you can now go to restaurants and have a water menu where you can get a bottle of water for thousands of rands served to the very rich among us. We've also got a, a yacht boom going on in the world. There's never been more billionaires at this point in time. But at the same time, life is harder and harder for people at the middle and the bottom end of the segment. And it's not just on an individual basis that we see this sort of separating effect among the, the winners winning really big and the losers losing harder than ever. We also see it across the landscape of business, right? So we see big businesses that did very, very well over the last couple of years. We all know about the billionaires and the big tech startups that did so fantastically over the last couple of years. But at the same time, it's been really hard for SMEs who had to find ways to pay payroll during lockdowns and to find ways to keep, keep the lights on in the midst of load shedding and all the rest of it. So there's a great sense of kind of unfairness in what's going on in the world. And I put this out there for context because this sort of sense of unfairness is permeating into the future world of work too. 
But it doesn't have to be that way. As our leaders across the world said, in the midst of COVID, after all this is over, we can choose to build back better, and we have to define what that better is going forward. But let's park the economics for a minute and also just have a little bit of context in what's going on in the world of technology at the moment because we're also in this tipping point right now, it also happened in the midst of COVID, where we're starting to shift to what people are now terming to be Web3, which is quite a vacuous term. So I've put together a tiny little history and present lesson to try and give you some context on what is happening there with technology and then we can connect those dots as to what's happening with the world of work. And if we do think about digital technology, we can kind of see that that first wave or age of digitization was really the age of sort of personal computing. It was a time of decentralization. It was, it sort of took place in around about the 80s and probably carried on until around about the global recession in 2008. And this was an era when suddenly cell phones were put into everyone's hand and individual homes had computers put into them. And suddenly individuals were able to connect with other individuals. We know what happened there. That age kind of moved aside for the second digital age, the age of kind of re-centralization, but the age of, as I call it, decommoditization, or the age of driving costs down almost to zero, the age of digital abundance, as many other futurists and people like myself spoke about, the age of the very big tech platforms and social media platforms that sort of connected us to each other, but through them as the intermediaries, and actually forced quite a lot of smaller businesses and industries out of business. We know this, it was the age of the, the big companies winning very, very big, but small companies often being sort of pushed, being unable to compete with those large economies of scale that we saw developing across the world. So it was a great time to be a consumer, right? You got lots and lots of things for free, not necessarily a great time to be an SME. But the third way we're moving into now that many people are kind of calling Web3 is kind of a collision of the world of the big platform companies and things like virtual reality technology and hyper-realization of, of graphics and that sort of thing with the new wave of decentralization coming from the blockchain and crypto kind of side of the world. And those are very different worldviews that have collided into this term which we're now terming to be Web3. But what it really is is the pushback once again towards decentralization, which is a good thing, once again, for SMEs, because it means more people are able to have a piece of that pie. But it's also an era of re-commoditization. In other words, it's kind of the end of the free-to-play era of the internet and moving towards a time when more and more of our digital interactions are priced and traded. So we're putting money back into the digital space. And again, this is causing a lot of disruption, but there are huge opportunities there for businesses who understand what's going on there. It's also opening up a whole lot of challenges in the world of work, which could become an issue if you are trying to manage some teams. But now that we've got the context over, we can move into sort of what's going on actually in the world of work right now. And to sort of define this new post-normal age, I think this image is quite, we could do worse than finding this image. And this image came out of the, the height of COVID. And as you can see, there are people sitting there on yet another Teams or Zoom call, which we're all very tired of, which is why we're here sitting here in this room today, if we are so lucky to do that. And what we see in the middle there is a little sheep, though. And this sheep was basically sort of sold out or, or rented out by a petting zoo called Sweet Farm in the United States to spice up boring Zoom calls in the middle of COVID, right? And I think that that's sort of very pertinent. It, it, it ticks a few boxes, because on the one hand, it shows how small businesses can react to very difficult times by thinking creatively. I mean, petting zoos were literally shut down for a couple of years, and they would have gone out of business if they didn't think of creative ways to bring in more money, like renting out their small, cute, furry animals to big corporates to spice up their Zoom calls. But it also speaks to the fact that digital connection isn't necessarily working for all of us. And there is actually a need to spice up those very flat, digitized calls with something a bit cute and a bit funny. And that kind of leads to the core thesis that I want to talk to you about today, because really what's happening when we're connecting the dots around digitization and this post-COVID era of work is we have to put a better focus onto actual human relationships. And that brings me to one of the first trends that I think is quite an important bellwether for businesses. And that's this concept of the productivity paradox that we started seeing. There was this idea, and many people like myself who have spoken about the future and about trends and the future of work, 
are quite guilty of this. We all spoke about, oh, you know, one day when digital transformation takes place, we're all going to be working remotely and it's going to be great for productivity because no one's going to be stuck in traffic and we'll all be able to have a better work-life balance. But the truth is, when we were all forced to do this during COVID, there was quite an interesting study from the Harvard Business Review that actually looked across the world at what happened to productivity when people started being forced to work at home. And what they found was that people are working more hours, but not necessarily getting more done. That in fact, we are replacing the hours we spent in traffic, and then some with extra hours working at home, which means that our work and our life boundaries are becoming increasingly blurred, but it also means that people are sort of running faster on the treadmill, but not necessarily getting anywhere further. In fact, I think we found in South Africa that looking at that particular study, that people were spending around 40 minutes, so close to an hour more overall on their working day when working from home, compared to going to the office and adding in those couple of hours that we spend in traffic, which is really quite interesting. And to come back to that sort of K-shaped recovery graph and how unfair the future has kind of fallen across the world, we can also see that developing nations in particular, including South Africa and places like Mexico and various other places in South America and Asia, on average, workers post-COVID compared to pre-COVID are spending about an hour more working a day Whereas workers in more developed parts of the world, wealthier nations like the United States and Europe, are spending about an hour less working on average a day. So I think that these sorts of signals kind of point to kind of a slightly unfair future going forward. But it also gets us to question again this concept of digital work and if it is working for everyone or working for everyone in the same way. And here I think quite another important sort of bellwether trend we can look at is a case study that came out of the United Kingdom. And the NHS looked at how loneliness was being affected by digital communications. And what they found was that with older people in the so-called baby boomer generation, they felt lonelier after having a video call with their family members than they did if they had no call at all. So there's this kind of concept that digital connect connections and that having those Teams calls and those Zoom calls can actually aid in disconnection rather than in reconnection. That it's kind of like drinking salt water when you're thirsty, but you can keep drinking, but you're not actually getting what you need out of that communication. And from a more future of work perspective, looking at the younger side of the market again, when it comes to Generation Z, that's the youngest part of your workforce, what we're finding with them is that actually working in digital environments, having basically their day-to-day -day life set up through Microsoft Teams rather than being an actual office space, is actually slowing down their career progressions. And this is because when we do plan out our days and we are interacting with our colleagues and with our staff members on digital platforms, those relationships become very linear and very planned. There is not much serendipity in there. You only invite it into the rooms that, you're, that you've got literally the link to. There's no chance encounters with colleagues from different departments or with supervisors that you can start to build relationships with that you can actually use to build your career going forward. So it's a challenge there to businesses who want to invest in the development of the younger staff members to actually give them the space to start building those out of linear or out of team scheduled calls kind of relationships going forward. But I just put this up there to say that perhaps the digital connections aren't working for everyone. They're definitely working for some. If you are a parent, it's very convenient to work from home. If you are wealthy and have a nice place to live, again, very convenient to work from home. But overall, this thing of the productivity paradox and the fact that people are lonely and disconnected and frustrated in their careers, does mean that mental health issues have become quite a critical aspect of managing the future of the workforce. Worry burnout is a term that my co-founder, Dion, Dion Chang, that works with us at Flux Trends, has looked at quite a lot. And worry burnout speaks to a sense of learned helplessness, where people are just constantly trapped in a sense of feeling that they're not getting anywhere in their careers and in their lives. And it's the sense of like low-grade burnout and stress that so many of us are dealing with, whether we're trying to run our own businesses and our staff members are dealing with this too, and our customers as well. 
So mental health is really one of those things we have to look at very, very carefully if we want to build more resilient teams. And we do want the future, of course, to be better than it was in the past. But what this sort of worry burnout and this, this low-grade sort of mental health crisis that's going on across the world has also done is it's caused a lot of us to do life audits, to reconsider how our lives are actually playing out and question those things like work-life balance and if our job and our career is actually making the most of the very few years that we really have here on planet Earth. And these life audits have led to the global phenomenon of the so-called great resignation. This is where people have quit their jobs or started a new job or gone on a long-term sabbatical and tried to really rethink about where they're going in life and what they want to do with the remainder of their time. Because there's nothing quite like a global pandemic to make you sort of question your mortality and what it is that you really want and what you really value with your time on a day-to-day -day basis. But the great resignation is just the sort of the thin end of the wedge. The deeper trend that we've looked at that is probably going to be of interest to all of you, anyone that is trying to employ a workforce going forward, it's also worth talking about this lying down flat movement. So while the great resignation spoke about people who were often quite in sort of middle life or partway through their careers that were reevaluating their priorities and how best to use their skill sets, the lying down flat generation was a phenomenon that started in China but has also been tracked here in South Africa. There are some academic researchers that are looking at it. And this is the phenomenon of young people not wanting to participate in the economy or in the capitalist system that we know it today. It's young people who are not wanting to find a job at all, which is a bit different to the unemployment crisis which we also have here in South Africa. So you're kind of having this grand irony of not being able to find people for the jobs that we actually do have available. And this, I think, is quite an indictment on our society because it's, quite a, it's, it's, it's telling us basically that these young people are just not buying in to the world that we currently have on offer and onto that sort of work-life balance trade-off that is being offered by companies right now. But companies are not necessarily taking this down, lying down and neither are employees because those that are still engaged in the workplace are also starting to almost kind of bite the hand that feeds, which we think is quite an interesting trend to look at. And this is the rise of employees who are not afraid to speak out against the employers for not behaving in terms of environmental, social, and governance kind of issues. And our favorite examples there came out again of those very big tech companies where the likes of Amazon and Google have now had employee unions rise up, but not to negotiate or to push back against employee benefits and pay packs, but rather to push back against the behavior of their companies, the ethics and values of those companies, which is really quite interesting to have your own employees kind of turn against you very publicly and call you out for your bad behavior. So the employees of the future are much more, much more vocal and they do expect a lot more from their workplaces. Of course, different trends play out in different ways and some of the ways that companies that we've tracked are looking to try and re-engage their employees to re-give them a sense of meaning and to try and attract them away from the lying down flats and great resignation movements is we've seen a rise of corporate spiritual wellness programs popping up, which is really quite interesting, because back in the day you kind of had this company sort of paid you a salary and you did your work and that was the whole relationship. But then we realized that a healthy workforce obviously is a more productive workforce, so we started getting sort of, you know, employee wellness programs, and then of course we started looking at mental wellness too, is also part of that wellness package, and financial wellness. So financial wellness days off or financial counseling for employees did become quite a big trend because again we have to look at the holistic wellness of the people that we work with if we want a healthy productive workforce but spiritual wellness is kind of the next one and here we're talking about special consultants coming in to set up rituals and to help your staff find meaning in their work which is quite incredible one of the companies doing that is called ritualist but I do know that even here in South Africa, there are now you know, corporate consultants who will come into your office place and help set up rituals to give people more meaning in their day-to-day -day lives, which is quite incredible. It's very different to the sort of employee-employer relationships we had back in the 80s. 
Other ways that businesses are pushing back here are definitely looking towards rejigging what the work week looks like. So four day work weeks are one of those global trends, as are more sort of flexible working environments where you're able to work in office a few days a week or out office a few days a week, or even things like unlimited leave, as long as you're meeting your KPIs. These are incredible perks and benefits, but they're things that companies are having to do in order to attract the top talent in their environments. And it becomes more important when we realize that we're now competing for a global talent pool. And if we are employees, we're also able to sell ourselves or market ourselves at a global level. Yes, of course, there are tax implications involved, but we all know people that earn dollars or pounds and still live in South Africa and vice versa. But what this really means is that we are competing as companies, as organizations, and as particularly as SMEs, with the global business environment to try and attract and retain the best talent. That's a very tricky challenge in the midst of the great resignation and the lying down flat movement. It means that we really have to be excellent and offer people all sorts of different sorts of benefits like spiritual wellness programs if we want them to work for us and not for a dollar based or Indian company or somewhere else in the world. We also have to figure out how to deal with the sort of hybrid culture, and we're having a hybrid event right now. This event is being streamed online, but also some of us are here in present, and here's a picture of an organization that has some team members sort of Skyping or Zooming in, other team members in a physical place. We're having to sort of deal with balancing these different needs, because again, younger people and perhaps older people might want to be in a physical space, other people with families might want more flexibility, and how then do you set up like an HR policy that's fair to all of this, that makes sure that everybody is being managed on the same terms? It becomes a very difficult problem going forward. I don't have all the solutions for you, but I think I want to encourage you that everyone's grappling with these sorts of challenges at the moment. One of the things perhaps we shouldn't be doing if we do want to build more resilient teams is sort of yielding to the temptation of trying to manage your remote workforce or your hybrid workforce the same way you used to manage people in the office space. In that we do have to give people a bit more trust to get on with doing their tasks when they're working from home. So we have obviously heard, all heard case studies of companies that want to install cameras even inside their employees' bathrooms in their personal houses to make sure they're not you know, abusing their time, right? Because that's the way our current salaries are set up. We pay people for their time, so we kind of have a right to track that they're giving us that time when we're paying them, when they're on the clock. But how do you actually track that when they're working from home and they switch their video camera off on the call? You don't know what that person is really doing. So you can double down on the sort of in-home surveillance and the keyboard tracking and the cameras in your staff's home and all the rest of it. But then, of course, team members push back against that and people sort of work to rule, right? They do exactly what they're told, but they become less empowered to work in their own time and space. The point is that we have to sort of rethink about how we are going to be managing those people going forward. And well, this quote was quite interesting in saying that what we really want is human connection. We want to build teams that have trust in each other and that work well together. And when we are starting to manage people through surveillance and through making, treating them essentially as though they are criminals, because yes, some people are abusing the system. We know there's another trend of employees actually having two salary jobs at the same time, particularly in the tech industry, and they can get away with it as long as they're really good at their jobs. But of course that's cheating if you're paying someone for their time and you're paying someone a salary. So it kind of works both ways, but the point is that we have to rebuild those human connections and that human trust if we want to have more resilient organizations going forward. But what this really comes down to is that when it comes to the future world of work, we have to reevaluate the contract that we have between the people that we pay and the people who are paying us. Effectively, it is kind of a social contract, right? Like I said, when you are paid a salary, you paid for your time, you give up some of your physical freedom in that you have to be at a certain place at a certain defined hours of time per day. And in exchange, you got some physical security. That is a defined paycheck at the end of the month. And that's the sort of world of work norm that we have at the moment. But remote work and hybrid work and the re-questioning of values 
all of these things are getting us to sort of question that trade-off and whether we need to have some give and take on both sides, that perhaps employees need to give up some of that physical security of a defined paycheck if they are going to want more flexibility in terms of time and location. And that's why we're kind of seeing new ways of work em emerging. On the one hand, we've got some organizations that are trying to replace employees altogether with automation because dealing with these problems is obviously messy and working with people takes time and of course it's tricky. And we have companies like Merlin who've developed the, the virtual Tom software, which will actually go and make a replica of the brain or decision making process of your employees and basically turn them into an algorithm. So you can just get rid of the employee altogether and replace it with the, with the piece of tech. Now, that's got some trade-offs, which we'll get into in a minute. That's one way people are dealing with these things, by leaning full into automation and cutting out the people altogether. Other people, though, are redesigning what it means to be an organization. And this comes back to Web3 and decentralization and the rise of decentralized autonomous organizations, which are different to companies in that companies have employees and employers and they have shareholders and all these stakeholders have very defined roles. With DAOs, or decentralized autonomous organizations, you instead have a collective of people who are all adding value to the organization and then getting paid for what they put in, for their effort. Because everything is digitized and commoditized, again, in Web3, we're able to do this because everybody's contribution can be tracked. And there, the distinction between what an employee and employer is kind of falls away altogether. That's another way that these things have been dealt with. But yet another way is to think about how in the end of employment as we know it is shifting to more ordinary kind of organizations. And what it's really shifting towards is a shift from incomes-based remuneration towards more outcomes-based remuneration. And DAOs are part of that, but ordinary organizations are doing this too. We're talking about a shift from defined salaries towards more and more people working in the contract and freelance and gig working space. This is across the socioeconomic spectrum. Everyone from the, from the sort of drivers that do the checkers 60, 60 deliveries all the way through to executives that would be hired on a contract or performance basis rather than on a time and hour trading based basis. And this can be both good and bad. It means, again, that we're giving up some of that sort of financial security of knowing exactly what we're going to get paid when. But on the other hand, we are going to be paid more fairly in terms of our contribution to organizations. This is a global shift. I mean, like LinkedIn has some great statistics there about how many people are now working in the, the freelance or gig or non-salaried space going forward. And with the rise of Web3, we're able to sort of track a lot more of those micropayments. There are even companies now that will help you get your salary instead of being paid at the end of the month, you can get your salary basically drip fed to you as you work throughout the month, right? So imagine instead of getting a lump sum of cash in your bank account on the 31st or the 25th or whatever you get paid, but rather you've got a constant stream of rands coming into your account for every hour that you work or for every hour that you logged into your work platform. This can be done now, and that shift to micropayments and to outcomes-based remuneration is quite a big one to think about, and it's quite exciting when you think about how we're going to get more compensated for the value that we are bringing to companies. There's a bit of a downside here too, depending on where you fall on the bell curve of how awesome you are in your industry, in that in a more outcomes-based remuneration space, where you don't necessarily get paid for your time, and you can have three jobs at the same time if you're the best in your business. What we find is that more and more careers are becoming more like rock star type careers, where again, like the K-shaped recovery, winners take a much bigger chunk of the pie, and everyone else is left scrambling you know, for, for the scraps thereafter which means that, that Web3 and the sort of era of work we're moving into is an era that rewards the best of the best with outsized gains, but it becomes much more competitive for the rest of the playing field. And for a lot of people, this is kind of a sense of constantly having to sort of run on a treadmill and not necessarily get very far. And on the other end of the scale, we're also seeing the rise of this sort of play to earn space or the next era of gig work, which is again being compensated for the contribution you give to systems, but it is shifting the distinction between what a job is and what playtime is. Again, this whole question of you know, meaning and value and how we spend our lives, but also to the sort of how precarious the economic status of so many people have become. I think the play to earn gaming space, of which Axie Infinity is perhaps the biggest case study to come out of COVID, 
And there's many reasons for that, because many people lost their jobs and were looking for some way to earn an income online without leaving their homes. And one of the ways that came up were these play-to-earn gaming platforms that allowed people essentially to play games online and then make money from that gaming. And the way they work is very similar to multi-level marketing plans, right? So if you want to buy into the game, you'd buy one of these little monsters you can see on the screen next to me there. And then you would train your monster and feed it, and you could fight it, and then your monster could become more powerful, and you can sell it to the next person, or you can breed it, and you can sell monsters to the other people that want to come and join the game, right? So much like a multi-level marketing kind of a, kind of a business, these things work out. But again, people that get into the games make much more gains than the people that get in a bit later down the line, hence the sort of pyramid shape of these sorts of things. But there's the sense of having to constantly demonstrate your value in order to make sure that you're still getting paid or getting compensated from participating in these systems. But they do speak to a need for people looking for different sorts of ways of working. They also speak to the whole gig work economy evolving quite quickly. I think one of the most interesting trends to come out of this is that some gamers are now unionizing against the game platforms who develop games, right? Much like your gig workers and your e-hailing companies, you started unionizing and organizing against the likes of the big tech platforms who weren't necessarily their bosses. But this whole concept of what is an employee, what is an employer, what are the new opportunities in this space are opening up lots of questions that could fall in lots of different ways. So if you are entrepreneurial, you can probably spot quite a lot of opportunities here. At the same time, this is what you're also competing for in terms of the talent pool. Like the, your future sort of interns have to determine whether they're going to work for you or whether they're going to play games for a living. Quite interesting, right? But anyway, let's bring it back to the humans in the room because a lot of this is a story about people, it's also a story about technology, but it's also a story about how humans are at the center of all value that we do. And when we try to commoditize all of our relationships and everything that we do, we can go too far down that road because from an economic perspective and a sort of a perfectly equilibrium economy, there's kind of no margin and no value. The margin we get as business owners comes from selling stuff to human beings, which is often based on intrinsic value or irrational human needs, rather than being based purely on fulfilling actually rational needs for individuals. And I think that this image that came out of COVID kind of speaks to the point that we have to remember that there's a lot of value in actual real human connection. These are one of the many images that came out of doctors ministering to desperately ill COVID patients using sort of, you know, screens instead of being there at the bedside. Or people that said their last goodbyes through an iPad rather than in person through a hug. And these sorts of things, again, get us to question meaning and value and remind us that all value really comes from human connection. And here we can come back to that point of serendipity that I spoke about earlier, about how young people feel they're not progressing in their careers because they're not being able to build relationships with key members of their teams or with senior leadership on a personal way. They're only invited to very defined online calls. And a lot of innovation, a lot of new ideas comes from serendipitous encounters, comes from chance encounters, and it comes from people bumping into other people, quite often in a very literal, very physical sense. And a good example we have there is about how, you know, when we have outsiders brought into our conversations, we can look at solving problems in quite new ways. And a great example there, as I said, also came out of COVID, where a children's hospital hired a Formula One pit crew to try and help them redesign the bedside manner or the flow the doctors and nurses ma made around the bedsides of children to speed up their ability to actually address those patients. Because of course we know Formula One pit crews can change tires really, really fast. It's all about ergonomics and spatial planning. And by bringing those outsiders in, they're able to solve those problems in quite distinct ways. But again, in a very human sense, right? And it's the sense of outsiders need a chance to come in if we are going to try and solve those problems and build those connections in more interesting ways going forward. And here again, there's this idea that we need diversity in our organizations. And in a South African sense, diversity is a lot more than just aesthetic diversity. It's also diversity of thought and diversity of 
who we are. So it's diversity of actually the inside, not just the outside that we're actually looking for. And that brings us back to the point that we want to bring younger people into our conversations. We want to be able to look at the world from the perspectives of all the people within our organizations if we want to solve problems together and if we want to build those deep relationships that are going to give us a competitive advantage in an increasingly digitized and automated world. We have to double down on the people in our organizations and we really want to make sure that they are as hybrid and distinct as possible, as, as, as uncookie cutter like as possible because anything that can be digitized, can be replicated, is no longer a competitive advantage, right? That's something we've constantly got to be aware of inside our organizations. And that's why we really need to double down on making sure that we've got very different voices, very different faces that are, that are bringing ideas to the table. And again, to sort of close off with, I could bring this thought to you in a slightly different way once again, as to how all that value comes from human beings bumping into each other in unexpected ways and mixing very different human beings with each other. And we all remember, because we're all South Africans, that we had quite a long prohibition during COVID when we were not allowed. We had to make do with, you know, spas, pineapple, and yeast displays in order to sort of fulfill our needs. But we definitely weren't the first society in the world to have, a, a, you know, a brush with prohibition. This is an image that came out of prohibition in the United States that took place like 100 years ago. But more recently, economists looked at the effect prohibition had on innovation in America in that time. And what they found was that states that implemented prohibition found that new patent registrations declined something like 18%. This is not because alcohol gives you good ideas. I'm absolutely not advocating that you all go out and go to your local bottle store. But rather, the reason the economists found that innovation declined where there was prohibition was because people weren't mixing with each other. Because people met with strangers, with people outside of their socioeconomic class, with new faces in those third spaces, which were saloons and bars and pubs. And when prohibition came around, people went to work and stayed at home and they moved within their much smaller, much more defined social circles. They lost the ability to literally bump into loose ties and that's where innovation comes from. That's where new ideas come from. That's where new businesses come from. It comes from bumping into actual human beings that spark new ideas. So I hope that story kind of inspires you to get out there and to only connect with people, with your own staff, with your own team members, and with the people that you have here today, because you have no idea where the next innovation, the next idea, the next business opportunity could come from. But we do know that physically getting out there and connecting to people is a very good place to start. Thank you very much. Amazing. One, two, one, two. Bronwyn, thank you so much for an amazing talk. That was really, really insightful. And thank you for that last piece of knowledge because when I get home at 10 o'clock tonight, I'm going to say to my wife, babe, business starts here at Hudson's. Yeah, here at Jolly Rogers. That's what I was doing. I was connecting with people. You know, it's for our future. It was really insightful. All right, listen, I'm going to have you guys indulge me for a second. Even the guys at home, if you're watching right now, uh, before we move on to our panel discussion, if you guys here don't mind just standing up, literally for one, one second. I know we've been sitting for a while. I'm trying to give you guys a break. This is for your own good. I've never done this before. I will be honest. I've only seen my gym instructor who I once saw, like once last year, she did this. So um, if we don't mind, can we all take a deep breath in, hold it, and release it in slowly in four, three, two. Another deep breath. And while you're holding it, set your intentions for the day. I have no idea what any of that did. I just, I wanted everyone to stand up and stretch their legs. You can sit down again. I had no idea why I did that, man. All right, so coming up next, a bit of a panel discussion for us and some Q&A, which will be led by our moderator. At the end of this discussion or this panel discussion, you should have more of an idea of um, how to deal with some of the struggles that we're facing in the ever-changing economy that we live in and, of course, the world of business in general. So I'm excited to introduce our moderator for this panel. She is from Flux Trends. She's the head of content, Tumelo Majopelo. She is not alone, of course. Joining our panel is the CEO and co-founder of Girl Code, Zandile Mkwanazi. 
and Nin from our sponsor, Head of Digital and E-Commerce at Standard Bank, Moshi Mashongwe. And last but not least, somebody I've been keeping a close eye on for years, co-founder of Tilt, Ari Kalman. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, in person and online. It's, uh, I mean, I think I'm still letting what Bronwyn has said settle in. It felt like literally being on a roller coaster ride, just gritting my teeth. So as you guys allow the information, the insights that she shared um, settle in, I just wanted to just let you know that we're going to have a panel discussion first. And then towards the end, our online um, attendees um, can submit any questions in the chat, continue the interactions, and we'll address your questions towards the end. Um, so the theme for today is um, business reimagined, and basically it's aligning your business with the future world of work. I'm sure you've all, I'm sh uh, you've been to so many online conferences, so I'm going to try and make this seem as painless as possible. <laughs> We've all heard that the last two years have been the most difficult two years for businesses, for individuals, for families, for everyone. And with that said, specifically for SMEs, they've had to actually chart uncharted water. And hopefully in this panel discussion, we'll be able to delve into some of those challenges. But not only the challenges, we're not going to make you miserable, not only the challenges, but the opportunities that maybe this time um, has presented just from observations from our panelists. Um, so as, as we get into what we're discussing, I just wanted to ask our panelists, um, running a business requires, it requires a lot of skill, especially if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a solopreneur, um, if you are a small or medium company, and it requires you to be agile. It's always required you to be agile before, correct? Like it's always been that way. Um, the pandemic happened. Um, a lot of people face challenges. My question is, what are some of your reflections and learnings from these past two years, specifically personally, in your businesses, in your companies, in your interactions? Um, your learnings personally, obviously, but with also reflections on what clients experience, your clients, because you're interacting with clients, customers, um, even your colleagues as well from the past two years. Um, I don't know, I'll start with you, Zandile. <laughs> like, what was it like for you yeah. as, like, as a business owner, as a co-founder? Yeah, thanks, um, Jimmy. I think for me, um, the one thing that I've definitely learned is don't be married to your idea, right? I think as entrepreneurs, you have this great idea, you know exactly how you want to execute it, and you're so married to it that even when outside factors are telling you it's not gonna work, it's mm. not gonna work, you're just like, no, <laughs> I want to do it this mm, way. So um, committed. Mm. Yeah, so you have to learn to pivot, um, and you have to do it quickly, right? So there's a saying that um, fail forward, so um, if you're trying something, it doesn't work, keep going, don't stop, but don't be too married to the idea. Be able to pivot and see you know, what the world currently needs, and mm. I think that's a very important skill as entrepreneurs. We've certainly had to pivot our model, you know, um, come COVID, as much as we're already a digital organization, mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't anticipate um, COVID, yeah. but the good thing is we're ready and we're willing to pivot and make sure that whatever we were offering is in line with what's happening and we're able to position ourselves, mm. you know, so that when we come out of it, we slowly are, um, companies are now looking towards us because we're like, okay, skills are important. We knew this before, but yeah. now we know it. And mm. so this is how do we reposition our offering um, and our value proposition and then go back to the market and say, this is how we can help with the current situation. Okay, and so that you. has helped us grow. Um, and yeah, I think that's what entrepreneurs need to do. Thank you, Ari. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, everyone knows the term pivot and certainly massively important. I think one of the fundamentals coming out of it, though, um, in sort of my context was, what is within my control? Mm. So there's a million things happening. There's a pandemic that you have no idea at the time how that's gonna impact stuff, but what can I do today in this moment that is within my control? Can I look at a client and come up with a proactive solution? Yes. Can I find the cure to COVID and figure out the vaccine? No. no. <laughs> so why am I worrying about finding the cure to the vaccine? True. What is within my control mm. and how can I cultivate a relationship and deliver to a client um, based on the resources that I have? Thank you. Mishima, any thoughts, any learnings, specifically from a client perspective? I think from a client perspective, initially it was uncertainty. And a lot of it came from just not knowing, you know, mm. what's next. And that reliance on the bank to say we are here um, in terms of what we, we term our beyond banking solutions. So 
it, it really challenged us as well to, to, to show up and, and work intimately with those customers and just hold them along the way and, and partner with them through this pandemic. And you will also imagine the time our uh, banking staff was uh, defined as essential workers. Mm. So we had to really think quickly and in terms of pivoting to say, in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a t in a time when customers are really looking for someone to assist, interact with, um, how will we show up and how do we ensure that we support them? So it was really a time for learning. Yeah. Um, I think both on our end and, and with the client as well, but really also came with a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Um, you talk about this was a time of learning and you had to adjust for your clients, right? But you, I mean, Standard Bank is a big bank, right? You have all these employees. How were you able to migrate to work remotely? Like you said, you mentioned it was an essential service. I mean, I'm sure it was challenging, but I also believe that there's some really nice gems that you can share with us about that whole transition, specifically over those two years. Yeah, yeah. In the very early stages, we were starting to work through our PCM plans and you know, figure out how we will work with a remote hybrid in an event of, of, of something of this nature. So that's what's required in any event from a bank perspective. But I think those BCM plans were put to test, mm -hmm. right? Um, it allowed us to adjust where relevant. Uh, the most important thing, I think, more than anything was the fear and the concern with, you know, everyone, our staff members, how do we keep them safe? How do we um, ensure that we can still allow clients into, into our branches and, and continue to mm. do banking? Um, you would have seen that there was also a lot of you know, uncertainty around as we ca came into that you know, <laughs> distance, you know, ensuring that your, your, your work environment is safe and stuff. We provided masks, provided sanitizers, engaging on ATMs became a hygiene factor as well. Mm. So there really was um, intention as well on our end in, in making sure that we adjust and align to what regulation required. In servicing our customers, paperwork and all the things that you generally have required that we also pivot and, and you know, digitize as yes. far as possible most of those processes. You'd already started digitizing anyway before, yes. which is great, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're talking about your clients, you're talking about like making sure that you keep social distancing because they want to come in and everything. Um, did you see anything, well, did you see any changes in your business and commercial clients' needs shifting? Did you see their needs shifting in any way? Were there fundamental changes in yes, their needs shifting? Yes, yes. So I think what I found powerful even from Bronwyn's illustration earlier was that there is still a lot of value in human interaction. So even behind those digitized processes, um, our clients still wanted to, to be able to interact, interact with, with, human. With, with human beings, mm. real humans at the background, um, the assurity and speaking to someone who's familiar. So it, it, it helped us also affirm our proposition from that perspective, uh, that even while we are digital and mm. we're looking at going digital, human interaction is still at the center of, of how we want to do our business. Mm, you're not talking to an AI bot yes. or a robot that doesn't yes. have to say your name properly, like yes. Google Maps yeah. voice. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it does happen, especially <laughs> in the South African context. <laughs> context. So Ari, um, you know, they say your team is as strong as you are, or you're as strong as your team, right? Um, how did you keep your team connected um, on top of things, uh, especially with your background? I'm, I'm sure you've got some really great um, learnings and case studies you want to share with us. Yeah, I mean, I think they say that, and in practice, it's sometimes harder to do. I think we all went through the phase of house party on a Friday, the app, and then joining, <laughs> and that kind of fizzled out quite quickly. Um, but I think it really brought a resurgence back to understanding that people are people. Mm. Um, they live in homes where there's a dog, and there's a cat, cat. and there's a neighbor who drills the whole day. Mm. Um, We've drawn, as people, this massive line between my corporate life and my life. Mm. And there are certain, certainly negativities to the intersection of the two. But, you know, if someone's an executive, they're still a person. They still want to lose weight. They still have an issue in their relationship. People are people. And it was gravitating back to that. And I think making the culture of the organization more human-centric. Mm. Um, the idea that you know, to see someone as a person. And it's much easier to do in an SMME than it is in a bank of That's thousands of people, true. unless you run it like multiple SMMEs, which is probably what you do. Um, but I think it's this kind of 
gravitating back to, I see you as a person, I need stuff out of you, and you need stuff out of me, so the relationship has to work and be reciprocal, mm. but I also get it if the cat is literally the reason that you're not in the office in the morning because <laughs> it had to go to the vet. Yeah. So it's gravitating back to that and deformalizing some of these corporate structures that we've put in place. So you're someone who works with brands, right? Um, how would you compare your industry's um, employee experience versus the human experience during this time, like that time specifically? So we're lucky in advertising because our role is to sort of reflect back the zeitgeist of the time yes. and to represent the audiences who we're communicating with and then build brand strategy Please around Please just that. let us know what the zeitgeist is because it's like this term that just you <laughs> threw out just to make sure that our viewers online in, in the house actually know what the zeitgeist is. It's just kind of um, what the time is. Yes. So the zeitgeist is that Beyonce is trending on TikTok. That's part of the zeitgeist. Yes. Or that so work-life balance is a big thing. Yes. Um, it's what the age looks like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it was really about um, kind of coming, having as a business that's reflective of the brands that we're working with and understanding that it was easier for us. I think if you're a plumber somewhere in the south of Joburg or the mm. north, of, there's going to be differences and nuances there mm. to who you connect with. But in our context, which is marketing and advertising, we need to reflect the people that we're connecting with. So we try and reflect as many people as possible. Thank you. Um, Zandile, uh, with hybrid, we're becoming the new norm. I mean, it's not the new norm for everyone, obviously, it's sector specific and obviously needs driven. Um, what systems or plans should be put into place um, to help small businesses um, stay top of mind with their customers? Yeah, um, so I'm a big app person. Like, I have so many apps on my phone. Yeah, I think, I think um, we're a generation <laughs> of apps. Yeah, yeah, apps, um, yeah, and also those that we try out in the organization. Um, I think communication is key. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be able to, you know, stay communicated with, you know, your team, your staff. And so for us, pers well, in the organization, we use um, Zoho. Mm. So Zoho has Slack. And we also use Slack because we have internal staff, which is quite unique, I think, to most SMMEs. But we also have volunteers. Mm. And these are people working at other organizations. Yeah, other people, yeah, we yeah. have like standard bank volunteers that literally, when they log off um, from work at 5 PM, they log on to Girl Code. Mm. Um, and so we have to also communicate with them. So we use um, Slack quite a lot. And I think when you're thinking about systems that will help, especially now in the hybrid world, you need to think about you know, communication, you need to think about your finances, you know, being online where it's, it's you know, transparent to the people it needs to be transparent to, of course. Mm. Um, and also how you acquire customers and get leads. So we use Salesforce a lot okay. where you know, the, the right teams can get on it and see where are we, not just with getting new clients, but also with managing our beneficiaries, right? Mm. These are our many, like, thousands now of um, young girls that yeah. are part of our programs, and we need to know how are they performing at any given time. I need to know, you know, how many do we have in the program? When does it start? When does it end? So when you don't see people on the day-to-day, -day, you need to, like, have those systems in place mm. so you can just log in and get real-time information. So those, those are some of the, you know, yeah, apps that I think are quite important for any SME. And so those apps normally, so you use those apps for your internal comms as well as your external comms, so communicating with your clients, your stakeholders as well. Yeah, so, okay. um, yeah, I think a lot of us probably use Teams um, and Zoom. And Zoom. So <laughs> Get by Zoom, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, that's, that's quite important because a lot of organizations use that, and that's how we communicate with our external um, stakeholders. Thank you. Um, Shima, having a clear game plan is a game changer when attracting and retaining customers. Um, just like Zandile just spoke, you know, she's, they've got a plan on of how they're going to communicate with internal and external teams. Um, what kinds of opportunities are you... Standard Bank, <laughs> enabling your customers to capitalize on this reshaped business landscape. And there's a lot of shifting parts of it, so. There is a lot of shift, and you would have seen in the media where we speak about becoming a platform business. Um, and that also opens up new ways of, 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 of banking, if I call it that, or new ways of us doing business, um, but also opening up to businesses um, that bank with us and those that sometimes don't. Um, to start um, selling or providing services to each other. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work and opportunities that, that comes out of that platform work and what we're doing from that perspective. Really stuff that excites me. Because um, not only does it create opportunity for the bank, but mm. it's, it opens up the economy for, for everyone to participate. Can you give in. us just an, I mean, if you can share, can you give us just an example of 
like one of the most inspiring case studies or platform work that you guys have done? If I look at partnerships and the stuff that uh, Naledzani and team were working on around uh, partnering with you know, one client that has a, a, a service that's providing service, and that, that service is provided to a wide range of customers that either bank or don't bank with mm. us. Um, the likes of um, payroll systems that, that become available. And then in that interaction, we, we do know that you know, there is a need for some s size of a, of a business to, to want to be able to run payroll. Mm. Um, but that partnership becomes twofold because not only do we partner with that provider of the service, we can also then partner with, with businesses that have other things to sell mm. and complement those type of services. Um, we open up to traditionally non-banking services, as mm. an example, where mentorship, oh, that's um, nice. and you're available to provide mentorship, you're able to, 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 to participate in those. So we've been um, piloting some of those, and I think it's some really exciting stuff that I think believes, believes to, to come through to, to assist um, in many ways, more than just doing banking. Um, we also deliberate and ensure that we partner with, with the clients along the way. And even the way we provide solutions, mm. it's not just one-sided. So should we need to provide a mining um, loan or some, something to, to, to a, a specialized industry? Mm. Um, we generally do have more than uh, one individual dealing with, with those type of transactions. We open up the ecosystem to make sure that uh, we understand your needs holistically yeah. and be able to address that. Um, generally, it's not just from a banking perspective, but it could be connecting you uh, to others in the mm. ecosystem. So, so it's like literally meeting any of your clients or customers at their point of need, but also offering auxiliary services around what they actually came to you for. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, you spoke about... Um, the more social development element, right? And that speaks to like um, training and stuff. And I think you do um, Go Code, right? But there's another organization that you also have. Um, that speaks to digital readiness as well, right? Like what are the key elements? In, like how are we, how can we make um, SMEs digitally ready? So we talk about digitization, we've got all these buzzwords, but I mean, for someone who's just started running their business, like what are the key points, what are the key elements they need to consider in order to be ready to compete in a digital market? Yeah, um, I think what's important for SMEs especially um, is to also meet your clients where they are, right? Mm. And everybody's online. We're echoing, <laughs> like, the, we're echoing the same yeah, thing. Yeah, like, meet them where they are. Yeah. Everybody is, is online. So um, part of being digital ready is also being online. Like, I've met a lot of entrepreneurs, and I ask them, okay, you know, what is your website? What is your social media handle? And they're like, uh, I don't know I what don't, you're talking I don't about. Have, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, I have a personal one. And so mm. if you're going to be serious about business and if you're going to grow your business, you definitely need to be online. Mm. Building a website these days is so easy. But to your point, right, a lot of people don't know. Um, and we sort of need to make a plan to make sure that that information is readily available mm. um, for SMMEs to know how to, how to get, like, build a website, you know, create pages. I'm TikToker. I think a lot of people TikTok are still is a challenge even for me, you're right. TikTok um, is a challenge. Yeah. TikTok and they think it's just hours. I mean, it is really, I spend like five hours mm. and then scrolling fast. Yeah. Um, you can get clients, you know, because you're creating short videos of information about your business. Mm. And that's a quick way to get to a lot of hands. You I'm so sorry, yeah, Chitijik. So no you're talking problem. about like TikTok and whatever, right? And I just want to just talk to you, Ari, specifically, yeah. right? So she's talking about TikTok. How has the market marketing landscape changed? Because TikTok is like literally on everyone. I'm sure they're like, there's a course online somewhere that says how to set up your TikTok account, how to generate videos. How have you seen the marketing landscape change in the past two years? And I know you're not a futurist, but from the work that you do, how do you see the changes being a positive opportunity for SMEs? So, you know, Tomelo, years ago, a brand had to get an agency to create a multi-million rand TV ad and then buy the media to put it out there. And though people are finding TikTok perhaps intimidating, mm. it is the best thing that could possibly happen to SMMEs. Mm. Because when you have the ability to create your own content and compete with what bigger brands are doing, um, you then have the ability to market yourself in a way like you've never had before. The opportunity to see so many people and connect with so many people. TikTok themselves will tell you to make TikToks and not ads. 
Um, and it's a fundamental game sort of changer. But if you follow a lot of brands in SA at the moment, they've got one person in the office. It's usually the Gen Z kid yes. who's banging out these TikToks. Yes, like and it's cakes. far more cost effective than a TVC was ever before. Mm. So, you know, I think sometimes SMEs think, oh, you know, I need a massive advertising budget. All you really need is to jump onto a trend and create a cool video and express your brand value proposition, put that on TikTok, maybe put a bit of media behind it, maybe not, and you have the opportunity to really game change that advertising. Um, so it is fantastic news that by virtue of having a phone and an idea, mm. you can now reach Love massive that. audiences. Love phone and idea, that's amazing, right? And I think for like the African market in general, we leapfrog the general population, global population. We actually adopted mobile faster yeah. and quicker. Yeah. So it makes so much sense that as a, or a business owner, you can literally run your business from your mobile device. Are there other platforms, before I move on to the next question, besides TikTok that SMEs can actually harness? So, I mean, I just asked you about the landscape of marketing. Are there other platforms that you can suggest that are not literally on the mainstream, they may be in the peripheral, they could be our blind spots, that you could actually just highlight that they might actually look into to maybe share what they have as services or products, uh, make their business grow? Well, I think it's fishing where your fish are. So <laughs> if you have created a baby bottle that washes itself, you're going to want to go onto Facebook and find the new mom and new dad groups and promote your product there. So sometimes it's actually easier when it's more niche to find the social platforms um, and the communities and groups that speak to specific niche things mm. um, and then market there. But I mean, even TikTok, there's probably, a, I mean, there's baby talk, there's book talk, there's every kind of talk. talk. So it's you cheap. definitely want to hashtag <laughs> with your baby bottle washing talk and uh, put that out there. But if you're on the platform um, and you represent your target audience, then it's the right platform. You don't have to overthink it too much. Now, we were talking about social media, right? And I just want to just now create like a bridge, right? Social media is now being used as a platform to sell goods, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the benefits? I'm going to ask Mushima, what are the benefits of e-commerce um, presence? Just having a presence online and having a sales channel that's based digitally. It could be reverse. It could be the other yeah. way around. We could have a physical store on our whatever. So what are the benefits? I think before I, I, I respond to your question, I wanted to add a bit to, to what the colleagues have shared. Yes. Is that on the other spectrum of what we see evolution in digital and, and, and social media is, is fraud. And I think a lot of awareness um, around just, you know, educating the SMEs around, you know, awareness around, mm. the, you know, what, what a safe behavior digitally or online looks mm. like. So that's really, really important. We're seeing a, a massive trend from a digital fraud perspective as, as it pertains to an uptick in some of these things. Um, not to say they're not good, right? So I think there's always a balance and mm. I think there's lots of awareness that's out there, but I, I don't think it's reaching everyone at the same rate that it's reaching, um, you, know, th you know, the good side is reaching mm. everyone and then the downside is not reaching everyone equally so it's just to to create awareness that you know on the there's there's up and the downside mm -hmm. um and we we just really should um approach that with caution you know where you use your email address and you know you get fished fished and it looks like it's a bank reaching yeah. out to you when it's not and you pay an invoice talking on that because i feel like that's a pertinent point and i mean i'm going a bit off topic just a little bit but you talked about like cyber crime and everything i mean are there some points that are so the people in house here and our online viewers can maybe just like the top five things that they need to like consider mm. whilst doing transactions online, mm. Um, mm. especially from a safety and security perspective, because yeah. you, are, you are correct. Fraud is not just an issue for big corporate entities, but it's, they are targeting smaller companies, yeah. Our yeah. entrepreneurs. Um, sometimes they're even targeting your physical site mm. as well and stuff. Mm. So um, can you just give us like maybe five, four, three points on how to be just safe, like the five points of safety, online yeah. safety. <laughs> So, if I can think of anything more than anything, is that your email is, is generally your, your central source of information. So it's just guard against you know what you subscribe to, uh, the links that you click on. Mm. Uh, be aware of some of these things. Suppliers that you haven't engaged in person, because sometimes you pay and this person is nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's where possible, you know, do a cross check some validation you know we so would it be would it be like calling so calling, if someone gives you the banking yeah. details calling that account, that bank to say does this actually account actually yes, exist for this yes, business yes, okay yeah okay. i think that's helpful so 
Yeah. You want I just wanted to jump on that because yes. I've experienced it myself. Oh, right? okay. Wow. Quite recently. Okay, um, you can share. Where basically someone or people I don't know um, through LinkedIn mm. is targeting my connections. Right, so they, LinkedIn, you put your email. It's, mm. it's to the point of email and you can, for most people, they don't make it, um, they don't make it hidden. So um, if, I, if somebody knows that I'm connected to you, right, I'm on LinkedIn, they can actually just go and get your email and basically send you something pretending to be me. And that's been happening. Um, I'm getting calls like, oh, Zan, you send me this and ask for money. Um, which obviously I would never you know, <laughs> yeah. ask people on yeah. my LinkedIn or just generally for money, um, but that's happened even to my whole team. So we've had to do a cyber security and cyber awareness um, training, which I think we took for granted before because we mm. didn't think you know, would fall for that. Luckily, nobody sent money to this um, particular account. So I think it's quite important to also be aware of your digital presence. Um, mm. And like, um, you know, as mentioned, email is quite important. So if you're subscribing, it's easy to just subscribe to things like, oh, this looks cool. Um, but you're actually giving out a lot of information just from that. And when you get emails also, not clicking mm. on stuff, even if, you know, it looks like it comes from, because it says, Zandi Lem Kwanazi, um, the one the email sent to my teammate, it said, I'm, I'm in a business meeting, or, you know, I was at a conference, um, please can you send um, 10,000 rand from the business account? Oh my, okay. And she, she almost sent oh it. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> she almost sent it. Um, but luckily, she had the good sense to go ask my co-founder, said, you know, I got an email, Zandi's asking for 10,000 rand, which is quite weird. Yeah. She would never ask me personally to send her the money. But doesn't um, that go yeah. back to the systems and like operating systems, like systems Se that you secure, put in place, yeah, yeah. secure systems, secure your, how your you, network, exactly. Yeah. So not 100%. just the technical systems, but just like if we need to pay out X amount, these are the processes, processes. that we follow internally. Mm. Yeah. Mm. If you get a random person DMing you on WhatsApp and saying, please transfer 10,000 <laughs> rands to the Cayman <laughs> Island account, you know, yeah. that's just a red flag, okay, yes. and block and, and report. Yes. Indeed. Thank you so, so much yeah. for say, sharing these really live case studies. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, Musima, do you think digital technologies are helping to address uh, frictions, right, to close the funding gap for SMEs? Yes, they are, and I would say we probably are not doing enough as, as, as South Africa, mm. um, especially where businesses are running informally, uh, trading, you know, in, in those type of things. Uh, I think of the rural um, and townships, so they, there's really um, an untapped market there mm. where we really are not penetrating as, as well Talk as about the township economy. Yes, mm. yes. So I think in the context where entrepreneurs have access to banks and have access to technology, you know, the, there is various op opportunities that are available. Mm. I think from a bank perspective, we do have, um, you know, different ways we, we assist. We have a supplier development um, uh, uh, department, we have enterprise development, um, and we also have, you know, banking and, and lending uh, solutions that are available. So we do, we do, I think, from a formal type of business, are, are really uh, entrenched in, in understanding the needs from a, from a, from a, from a client need perspective. Um, opportunity still lies in, in, in what I'm calling rural, township, and, and maybe informal. Mm. So there's a lot of opportunity in, t in the township economy for business development Definitely. and finding opportunities. Yeah. Um, Ari, the COVID pandemic has most certainly forced us to wear a lot of hats um, and learn a lot of skills. I mean, I don't know if some of us learn skills or we just have an ex existential crisis. Um, <laughs> but how would you say that this can be beneficial to a growth strategy for SMEs? Yeah, I mean, I think... Look, we could spend uh, the next 20 years deciphering what COVID did to us, <laughs> or we can just accept the reality that we are where we are. Mm. I think the fundamentals of successful business has largely always been about relationships and delivery, mm. and those two sort of push and pull factors working together. Mm. I um, have a great relationship with you. I do this piece of work for you. It executes on what you want. It grows our relationship. It moves to the next piece of work. I bank with Standard Bank, they give me a home loan, they deliver on the relationship, and those two things have to work together. 
Very often we convolute it with a million and one other things and we look at the mountain like this versus looking right directly in front of us mm. and realizing that incremental changes like moving on to a Google Open Workspace is a small pivot that you make that ultimately takes you into a completely new direction mm. where your business is super technologically sort of profound. So I think it's one chunk at a time. SMEs, there are probably so many people watching this right now thinking, should I even start this thing? Because X, Y, Z, Q, CNN, BBC, <laughs> E! News Africa, ESCOM, like, is this going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> and the honest truth is, have a relationship, build a relationship, deliver on something, work it cyclically, and try and just make small little things once a week, every three weeks, and ultimately it builds that journey. It's the same as losing weight, running a business. <laughs> you just cut out a little bit of sugar, less and less and less and less, pivot in a slightly different direction, and before you know it, you should have sort of something that resembles quite a bit of success. And unfortunately, it is those memes of looking at the mountain like this or like this. Yeah. But don't ever look at the mountain. mountain like this. Just <laughs> keep it <laughs> one right step in front. In, yeah, one yeah. step in front of the other. Um, I'm just going to open this, um, put the last closing questions, and then we'll go to our uh, questions from our online um, attendees. I just wanted to ask you, for small businesses, what advice... Um, can you give them when they're trying to tap into, I mean, millennials, obviously, we're tired of hearing about millennials, <laughs> but also Generation Z, which are technically entering the workplace right now and are the largest actual consumer market for this continent and other developing nations. But, I mean, what advice, I will start with you, Ari, because you told us not to look at the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and we must... Um, up, uh, like look at our challenge as losing weight step by step. Um, tell us how do we, and then I'll ask Andy, and then um, Mushima, you can share as well. But like, how do we engage with Generation Z? And are they that much different to any other generation? So I think I'm going to give you the definition of technology, right? Which <laughs> is um, to all of us in this room, a toaster is not technology. It's just a, it just is what it is. I've yeah. always known a toaster. <laughs> But I promise you to the people that bought their very first toaster when they were 50, it innovation. a toaster is technology, it's yeah. innovation, it does something with the bread, suddenly the thing is brown, this is amazing. And you have to realize when you're trying to connect with younger generations that these platforms, TikTok, Instagram, are native to them. Mm. It's interesting if you watch people of different generations, even scrolling through their phone, you'll find all the people are very hitting Tactile, it with the finger yeah. doing... Whereas if you watch a kid on a bus or whatever, that kid is just flicking mm. through this thing. And I think it's one, recognizing that, and two, being open to that, mm. and three, getting onto the platform. So you cannot have a TikTok strategy if you have never been on TikTok. And it sounds so simplistic, but I promise you, sitting in rooms with people, they say, we should do this, that, and that. And you say, well, what's your handle? And they don't have a handle. Mm. So if you're not going to go to that level and connect with someone, understanding that it's native to them and technology to you, you're going to fail. You have to be on the platform of the person you're trying to connect with. Otherwise, you need to sell your product to the people of your generation and hit that Facebook marketplace. But I think there's a lot of ego involved in it when actually it's really looking at your six-year-old as someone who can contribute to your business positively versus someone whose screen time you're just trying to control. Thank you, Zandi. In yeah. a minute. <laughs> um, no, I was going to echo the same yeah, sentiment. Yeah, I thought there was a TikTok um, from Lizzo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so I think um, it's important to meet, you know, like we'll keep saying it, yes. to your customer where they are. I have a brother, he's, he's 20, um, and he, he's not planning on working, right? And we heard that earlier on, like, I, I don't want to work for anybody. Mm -hmm. So, but you still need people like that to contribute towards you trying to create. And I think... More and more, it's not about finding employees or you know getting them to come work for you. It's about how do you collaborate with them? Yeah. How do you go to where they are? Like you find a you know 18 year old with a million followers. Um, that person is not coming to work for you. But mm. how do you like collaborate? And mm. I think that's the world we're going into now. It's about SMEs finding those collaboration points with people that are influencers um, and helping you know grow their business through that channel rather than trying to find employees. Um, I think, yeah, that's so it's more like works. sharing the pie instead of finding your own pie and baking it and 100%. farming everything. Okay. Yes. And yeah. then Musima? I think we, we also are getting to a point where if I recall Bronwyn, that it's, it's, it's not going to be someone who's sitting across a desk nine to five. You know, they, 
they, they are diverse, they have unique requirements in terms of what, what excites them and where they evolve. So work for them is also very different to, to how we see it. And we see it even in the businesses that we bank, you know, the nature of that generation, um, the nature of the businesses that they run is slightly different. Um, we've seen a shift from what we knew as hobbies becoming real businesses and careers for, for, for these guys. So it's just to be relevant and connect with them and find them where they are and, and ensure that you, you're part of that, yeah. I'm Ari, I've got some questions. Thank you so much for those who contributed. It's nice to see questions come through. Sometimes you're talking to yourself. Um, <laughs> it's lovely to get the questions. I've got three questions. The one is actually addressed to you, Ari. Um, what advice do you have on creating social media content and keeping it fresh? I know you already mentioned that the digital native toaster thing, but if you have any other pearls of wisdom, someone would like to know, how do they keep creating fresh, relevant social media content? So yeah, I mean, uh, the good news is that we're moving very much to UGC. Um, just this shift of kind I'm of... I'm so, so sorry, what's UGC? Oh, user-generated <laughs> content. Thank you so much for just clarifying so, for the rest of us. UGC, user-generated content, and it's this shift from hyper-curated Instagram aesthetic holding the bottle perfectly to this kind of TikTok age where it's viral, it's authentic, it's uh, shot in the shower, but hopefully in a <laughs> good way. Um, and what it means is that you really need to create something that looks like what life and everyday life looks like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you are a banker at a Standard Bank and you show us your daily routine and show us how you engage with clients or whatever, it doesn't have to be this curated piece anymore with this crew of 500 people. Mm -hmm. um, it can really be something that taps into a trend or an insight that uses a Lizzo song that does a dance routine halfway through. It can be a lot more authentic. And I think it's just important to really emphasize this point of don't over curate the stuff. Mm. Take a look at the video that's got 10 million views that I guarantee you doesn't look like it took more than five minutes to create mm. and benchmark your stuff against that and don't overthink it. Create something that your mom thinks is funny, um, that the person down the road thinks is funny and try and weave your brand narrative sort of into it um, and you can fail a hell of a lot because, you know, every fifth TikTok is going to be a successful one. Um, but really, just make it look like something that anybody could make because that is authentic and that's what people resonate with. Thank you so much for that. G um, Jerry, um, you asked during this COVID-19 pe period, what has been your experience of success or failure rate of SMMEs and why do you think SMMEs thrived or collapsed? I think I'm going to ask Mishima to maybe just give us some insight from your observations. Yeah, and I think what has been a challenge is the inability to tilt, right? Where, you know, you reliance on income was from, from one type of entity um, and that the industry that we, 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 some of the industries that we saw taking an uptick was around technology mm. um, and we, we saw an uptick in that and those that were more traditional in nature either had to tilt or you know, just, mm. just, just like not. Like the petin zoo that Bronwyn had yes, there with the little yes. sheep. Yes, So I think the challenge, while we know that, uh, you know, funding is, is one of the things, but I think not, not even being clear about the market that, that you want to serve um, makes it even more challenging. But I, I, what I've seen is that technology had been at the forefront of this. We've seen an uptake of our e-commerce solutions right during COVID. Mm. And we've seen a massive uptake uh, in terms of sales, even on those e-commerce platforms where mm. we allowed customers to use that as a method of selling mm. instead of you know, physically delivering goods. So I think anything that's allowing you to move into this new wave of e-commerce, TikTok in terms of, of advertising has really shown, I think even in the data when we look at it, that there's really potential. And you know, while we are exposing our clients to this, to my point earlier, helping them to, to save proof their businesses as well is equally as important. Um, I have another question. I'm so sorry, it's a standard bank one. Um, I have another question for you. It's from Katleho. Um, he's, or he or she's asking, how do you assist small businesses in the tourism industry, grants for slash funding, question mark? Yeah, so 
we've got various sectors mm. so there is a, there's a high sector focus from mm. from our perspective um, if I use healthcare as an example, so we have a dedicated team of healthcare practitioners that would work and partner with a potential customer in this event. And where there's a need for funding, um, team that's headed up by Nalezani is, is really also entrenched in that model, depending on the sector and then the enterprise development team is also plugged in there. Mm. And like I mentioned earlier, that it's, it's, it's not one-sided. Mm. Then you, you have and a... Yeah, it's not a, a one-sided yes, approach. Yes, have a variety well. of, 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 of experts that, that would sit with you across the table to really understand the unique needs of your business and partner with you and, and sort of help you evolve to, to get to where you want to be. So, yeah, we're open for business. Okay, because <laughs> I was going to say, so for Gatlejo, they must contact you. Yes, and they okay. can reach out to both myself and Nali. If they're in the room, of course, we, we're still here. Yeah, because yeah. I think that, okay, thank yeah. you. And then another question um, for Standard Bank, <laughs> literally. How can our small business benefit from your enterprise um, development, I think. Uh, we bank with Standard Bank. Is that enough for us to benefit from enterprise development? Please provide details, etc. Yes, and I'm gonna maybe just touch at a high level. I wish Nale was mic'd up to, to help me <laughs> yeah. fill the, the more detail. But um, like I said, it's sector focused. Mm. So we would be able to understand the needs. There's a couple of initiatives that are currently running. We have a, a, a black female uh, development oh, program that's, that's currently running. Uh, we had a mentorship platform that was running as a POC. So there's a couple of initiatives depending on the trends and the needs that we see. So there's about 100 women on that um, black women um, initiative that's currently running and it's running for 12 months, I think. So depending on the needs, of course, mm -hmm. um, we would be able then to plug them into, into the right space and, mm. and see how we can assist. Thank you. Um, Zandile, you're not sitting here quietly just <laughs> watching us talk. Um, there's a question that has come through from um, Deboho and it's saying um, collaboration is key in today's day and age. How has this helped your business grow? How important has it been in your growth strategy? In, yeah. in like two minutes. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, I think for us, we're always looking at, you know, who else is doing what we're doing or doing it better, right? Mm. I think there's also, you know, a different way to think about your competitors. We, we actually like to partner up with people that are sort of in our space and mm, aligned to your Yes, yeah. because that's where you can learn the most. Mm. Um, and that's the trade-off where you're learning from them and they're learning from you and that allows your business to grow. So um, when you're looking for collaboration, it doesn't have to be someone completely outside of the industry. I think stop being, you know, scared of like, oh, it's my competitor, they're going to steal my idea or whatever. Um, those are the people you need to partner with mm -hmm. and figure out what value do you bring to the table, what value do they bring, and what are the trade-offs that you can get from what they've done and what you've done. I so love yeah. that you highlighted that because at Flux Trends, we looked, we cover trends, obviously business trends, and we look at them and harness their potential for business strategy. And w the trend that's really coming through is this B2B sharing economy mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there's a collaboration across um, companies, businesses, like small companies where they have like a shared target market, similar goals, but they're coming together, harnessing the full potential of all the whole entire demographic to be able to actually continue to thrive or keep business open or you know the lights on and stuff. And it's, it's the case studies we have are working very, very well. Um, I've, I've got a really, off the top of my head, Workshop 17 has so many partners that give different, um, different um, benefits to their members and anyone who uses their premises. So that's actually a very, really great point. My last question, I don't know who wants to answer this, but if you guys, if all of you have an answer, it's fine, I'll accept it, it's okay. And if one of you wants to answer it, it's fine as well. <laughs> um, with so many aspects to reimagine and reinvent, because there's a lot to consider, especially when you're running a company, and sometimes you're doing it on your own, mm -hmm. and it can be a bit overwhelming, right? What do you think should be top of the priority list, specifically in the times that we're living in? Um, like in taking a small business to the next, whatever the next level is. The next level could be maybe getting more people to come and buy, migrating online, having e-commerce, um, starting a social media page to reach a demographic like Generation Z that I'm not able to tap into. I'm hoping you guys can just give us like maybe different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Like how would a small or medium enterprise go to the next level? I will start with Ari. Sure. Uh, <laughs> You just focus on your area of expertise and it'll just come out of you. Well, I mean, that is kind of the answer <laughs> that I was going to give. Um, I think it is, 
I think it's appreciating growth in any format. Mm. Um, whether it's the growth of a staff member that you see them going from being average at something to amazing, whether it's the growth of a bottom line, whether it's the growth of culture, as long as there is some form of growth, I think you're on the right track. You don't want to look at the thing and think, how am I going to compete with uh, Facebook? They're a massive company. I'm on my own path, doing my own thing, and I'm in my own lane with what I can control within my own context. But as long as there's some indication of growth, mm. I think you're fine. And it's not a sexy answer to give you, mm -mm. but I genuinely think that Very if practical. someone goes from you know, being average at their job to being great, and at the end of a year where they've been with you for a year, they say, you know what, I really learned something out of that. Mm. And you made four rand more in the process. That's growth, and that's enough. Thank you. Yeah, maybe just to jump on that. Um, uh, you must just also have another yeah. original one because we're trying to give people <laughs> as much as they can get to take yes. home with. Um, I think for me what's important is to really understand your customer. Mm. Right? So spend a day with a customer or who your ideal customer would be mm. um, because you, you think you know what their problems are. Right? You've created an idea because you think you're solving their problem. But what I've seen is actually spending time with a customer or customers, mm. you get to know so much more um, and so you get to bring so much more value. So you thought they needed just water and then you realize, oh, they actually need coffee and they need juice and they need this and exactly, that. And then exactly. that's how you can grow your business mm. because you're not thinking for your customer and what they need. You're actually spending time with them, getting to know what it is that they actually need and you're providing the right solution. And, and they're so actually doing the grow. thinking for you, exactly. not some sucking. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Mishima? I think being consistent about the problem you're looking to solve because mm. if you can find that you'll be able to I think add it to what um, the colleagues are saying. Um, what I've seen worked is that really being obsessed with what customers are looking, understanding their needs, understanding their pains, what is it that they're doing every day and how is it that you can delight them, mm. right? Um, technology is coming, is here actually, it's here to stay. It's how you can leverage off that and there's really, really power and opportunity in partnerships. So I think to not take that for granted and walk the journey alone, there is just so much you can, you can leverage from, I think, from other businesses, from technology, from, from us as an institution, but there's really, really everyone waiting and, and, and willing to help and assist. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your wealth of wisdom. I wish we could do this the whole day. I mean, I don't mind, but like no, people we have to go are, around the business. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, like, thank you so much for your contributions, your insight, your knowledge, specifically your wisdom as well. Um, I'm just going to wrap the, like, the points that we've gotten here. Basically, um, as a small medium enterprise, you're faced with so many challenges in general. The pandemic has literally forced you to be agile, to continuously learn. There are three points or three key teams. Firstly, there is hope. So it's not like it's really dark and it's dreary. Um, there's hope for anyone. Like Ari said early on, just start. Don't look at the whole mountain and say, okay, I'm going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Do the training, take each step, cut off the little fat on the edges um, and get it done. Be consistent, like Musima said. Um, focus on the growth. Even if the growth is just going to give you four rands extra, focus on growth and being consistent. And meeting, this is the one overriding theme. Meeting your customers at their point of need, understanding them, um, connecting with them, even if it's just that one customer who's a representative of the entire demographic. Spending the day with them, seeing where their challenges are, seeing what the problem is, not from your perspective, but putting yourself in their shoes. Um, and then from a w hybrid workforce and um, like a digitization, same, it's the same messaging, meeting your employees at their point of need, everyone's at different levels, um, see what their needs are, Catering. I feel like there's a lot of the theme is also a lot of individual like, like individual service, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at each context the way it is, right? That's the general sense that we're getting from this. So there's great potential for um, small medium enterprises. There are pockets of change, and then I'm just going to throw in my two cents worth is that look at your blind spots. What are your blind spots? There's something that someone is not doing that you could be doing. That is also an opportunity for growth and development. Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you to our panelists for joining us. Thank you for those who are here live. Thank you for those online. Thank you for submitting the questions. It would have been really awkward if you weren't submitting the questions. <laughs> and I'm just going to hand over to Msizi because he's just going to ramp up the room and give us all the energy. Thank you so much.
That was amazing. Thank you so much to our panel for that. I mean, a lot of great nuggets to take away from that. A lot of things that I was listening to as a business owner myself. And, you know, and just confirming, you know, just being able to confirm that we're on the right track. And yeah, that is the right way to go about it. I mean, some great analogies in being used about a mountain. You know, I think very often we see these insurmountable problems facing us. And, uh, and just getting on with it too. You know, we all know that we've had a challenging couple of years. Everyone has. Businesses, individuals in general. It's been a rough year. Okay, what next? How do we move on from that? And tackling that, mount, uh, that mountain one step at a time, you know? Lions don't eat the whole thing. They go one bite at a time towards animals. And I think even the idea of collaboration that the ladies mentioned is so important. Understanding that you can't do everything. I think some of the smartest rooms, I saw smartest people in the room also understand that they aren't the smartest people in those rooms. So just collaborating and partnering with people is so important. So thank you one more time to our panelists. Thank you. We appreciate that. Oh, by the way, Ari, I got that, um, that, that re re reference to Lizzo, eh? Yeah. In a minute, I'm going to need a sentimental. Now, if you want to be really cool, yeah. you make a TikTok in front of everyone and okay. post it just now. In a minute, I'm going to need a... <laughs> just, just joking. I'm the generation that just get TikTok. I'm, I'm, I'm still on Instagram, like the boomer that I am. Um, we move on to our final address for today. I mean, uh, listen, I just want to state that the, our next speaker, I've been a fan of for the last seven years. When she walked in the room, I was like, oh my gosh. I remember meeting her. I was still in Durban. I used to work for East Coast Radio back then in 2015. And I went on Facebook because I've been sitting next to her the whole morning. So I wanted to show that I'm not lying. This is a real thing. Went on Facebook to my memories. I'll find it. Don't stress. I've got all the time in the world. Don't worry about it. 2015, for those of you in the room who can see, camera, it's too far to zoom, out, zoom in. But my caption was, like a proper fanboy, oh my gosh, you won't believe it. I just met a woman who might spend the rest of her life on Mars. Can you believe it? Hashtag Cray. Hashtag YOLO. Because we were in 2015. <laughs> Obviously. Obviously. And she's here to inspire us about the future, the possibilities, of course, of exploration-driven innovation. She is, talk about being the smartest person in the room. When I read these titles, I remember just how dumb I am, hey? That there's a lot of learning to be done. She is a physicist, a technologist, and an advocate for off-world exploration. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage, Adriana Murray. Hi everyone, special thanks to those in the room and special hello to everyone joining online and what a fantastic uh, morning it's been with the other speakers, um, so thanks for setting the tone and uh, the title of my talk I think echoes a lot with what Bronwyn was saying, so that those serendipitous uh, encounters can drive new ways of thinking and I think this is basically just another way of saying it, that getting out of your comfort zone drives new ways of thinking. Um, so, so let's dive uh, in a bit to my interpretation of exploration, which may be a bit uh, outlandish or a bit out of this world compared to other people's versions of exploration, but the, the, p the point remains the same. Um, so I do have a background in quantum physics, and there's actually an app that you're going to need to download. Um, and we're going to do a quick quiz at the end based on your understanding of this. So we're going to put the top winners of the quiz on the slide, and actually the lowest scoring members are also going to... I'm kidding. <laughs> I do have a background in quantum physics, that is some piece of stuff that I could talk about, but uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, there's a bit more of me in this talk than usual, um, but bear with me. Uh, I'm going to try to illustrate um, what is hopefully relevant for all of you in terms of how do we approach business or life in 2022 based on uh, the past couple of years that we've all been through. So let's, let's reflect back a bit for me, back to growing up in Peter Maritzburg in the 1990s. So we didn't have robotics or coding or any fancy high school projects at that time. Um, we'd made paper mache models of things, and this was our uh, science project, building a city on Mars. So actually, since much younger, I've had the idea that I would participate in exploring beyond Earth. And what a, what a crazy time to be alive in general. But in fact, even during the pandemic, we saw massive achievements in the space industry, like three individual missions arriving to Mars. Um, during 2020 and 2021. That was China, uh, the UAE, 
and NASA for the ninth time landing on the surface of Mars, but that's the first time in history we've had traffic from Earth to Mars. So in spite of you know, all the economic shutdowns, etc., the space industry did go ahead. Um, so for people thinking space is, is very far from them, what I hope to do as we go through is to show uh, the relevance of it for you, but I think also to explain that the space industry is happening, so we don't need to think about whether it should happen, but how we can participate in arguably this grand era and stuff like this coming to culmination. Um, so uh, this uh, was uh, you know, a meeting in CZ back in Durban, so I said we've both, we've both moved uh, out of Durban. I'm not on Mars yet, so sorry to disappoint uh, anyone who thought that, but um, you know, I was kind of the face uh, of uh, people moving. 2022 was supposed to be the first cargo mission of the Mars One project to Mars. So um, as we've heard from the panel, you know, how, do we, how do we restructure things based on the changing realities that we face? Um, at the time, I was working at SAP and innovation, um, and then in 2019, the Mars One project declared bankruptcy. For anyone wondering the update, it's a startup, you know, not unusual for startups to declare bankruptcy, and that's what had happened. And so a lot of people said, oh, shame, you know, what are you doing with your life now that you're not going to Mars in 2024 anymore? And I said, listen, yeah, you know, a startup declaring bankruptcy uh, is not a good reason to <laughs> relinquish the dream of expanding beyond Earth, you know. Um, we are curiosity-driven explorers at heart, I believe, as humans, um, and we live in this curious age where, like, Mars is within reach, but on Earth we have these massive challenges, and how do we balance these two capabilities of being able to explore space, but yet watching growing inequality back home. And so I founded Proudly Human in 2019, and uh, this quick video will uh, um, explain more than I can say in a minute. So. I want to go to Mars because to me, the allure of the unknown has always felt far more powerful than the comfort of the known. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Proudly Human's Off World Project is a series of habitation experiments in the most extreme environments on the planet to prepare for life on the moon, Mars, and beyond, and to improve standards of living on Earth. During each experiment of several months, a carefully selected team will arrive in an isolated location, build infrastructure from scratch, run projects, and live as a community while participating in making a documentary series. Do you have the right stuff? We are looking for resilient people with diverse expertise, a passion for adventure, and a story to tell. Apply now to join our off-world community. When we allow ourselves to dream, when we believe in our dreams, and more importantly, when we take active steps towards achieving those dreams, that it becomes possible to create a proudly human future, whatever planet we're on. Thank you very much. So we, we do have our applications open, so if any of you planning a, a pivot um, and want to join one of our expeditions to extreme places on Earth and beyond, um, uh, you can uh, apply on our website. But uh, let me change the tack of the story for a bit and um, show this particularly obnoxious picture of me in a jet on the way to Antarctica in December 2019, you know, on top of the world, visiting my seventh continent, like everything's going well. In 2019, I think I traveled the equivalent distance to the moon and back, that's like 750,000 kilometers, um, giving presentations on you know, the imminent dream of uh, being part of a team that's going to Mars like any minute now. And then um, I'm going to show a video now of what I did in 2020, uh, and I think this really embodies um, what we've been hearing about having to shift and the impact that the pandemic had on us. So given that uh, travel was pretty much cancelled, given that that was the form of revenue for me and the company, uh, Proudly Human, that I'd established at the time, I had to rethink everything. So my partner and I decided that we would speed up construction on this cabin we'd been building in the forest um, for fun, and actually we were going to be living there. So it was no longer like a fun project, but something that we had to finish and live in for the imminent apocalypse that was like lockdown in South Africa where no one really knew what was going to happen. So this is a time lapse, but this is the real route down. It's not edited. So this is the only way to access the place where we decided to build the cabin. And what on earth does this have to do with space? Well, actually quite a lot. So what we had to focus on here is shelter, number one. Number two, power. How are we going to power ourselves down there? You might say solar. There's very little light in this valley. It's 300 meters down in the valley. So that cancels that. So we were carrying 20 kilogram car batteries down. And when they run out, carrying 20 kilogram car batteries back up. Eventually, we 
like sucked it up in water generator. Um, so we made our stuff out of wood, not a very space era tech, you might say, uh, but this was the cheapest way and the way that we could carry the stuff down the hill in order to construct this cabin. So we got quite, quite creative by the time we got to building the walls and incorporated like metals and plastics. Um, and I don't know if this kind of design has been done before, but it, it worked quite well. And it was coming into winter, bear in mind. So gas was an alternative energy source that we made good use of. Um, the canister runs out less quickly than the car battery. So the 20 kilograms that you still have to carry back up the hill lasts a bit longer. Uh, power, that was power. You're watching the shelter getting put up now. Next critical fundamental resource for human communities wherever in the solar system they may be, water. So we had the luxury to be living uh, in a place that's quite remote, as you can see in the Titicama. So we had a river running by that was clean enough to drink. Um, so we are carrying buckets to heat on the fire for showering. We had a gas uh, geyser, but it broke. Um, you know, things break and essential items like a new gas geyser were not available to us. Sorry, non-essential items like a gas geyser. So we had a lot of challenges, but in the end, what a beautiful experience. Um, getting back to nature, my boyfriend is an environmentalist survivalist, so he was in his element finding new species every day in the area. And I was like desperately trying to work because I had one bar if I put my phone in the gutter on the roof. Um, connectivity, another essential thing. So shelter, power, water, food. We weren't growing anything because we didn't have much time to get any garden going coming into winter. And communication systems. So I'm gonna come back to the shelter, power, water, food, comms. These are the critical things. And don't ask me about carrying that bed down the hill because <laughs> it was worth it, but um, yeah. So let me add, it was a grounding experience getting back to nature, but it was a humbling experience and a heartbreaking experience at the same time because we did this as a fun project, right? I mean, at some point it didn't feel as fun as it did in the beginning, but some people live in far, far worse conditions than this, not as some experimental project, but as a reality of everyday life without the luxury of clean water nearby, without the luxury of a hot shower, even with buckets on the fire, um, and without the capability to spend uh, 25,000 Rand, which is basically the cost for putting that all up. And that was the cheapest way that we could get it done. Um, so we carried two tons of stuff down that hill. Um, and yeah, that was the power, water, food and comms stuff. So how does this experience relate back to thinking about space exploration, to thinking about poverty, in which the poverty in which so many people live, particularly in South Africa, this is impossible to ignore. How do you reconcile all of these things going on with off-world exploration? And uh, let's, let's get back to basics. And first of all, in case uh, some people get like a vague look in the eye when you mention space, I'd just like to spend this time reminding us that we are in space already. Um, every day we see the sun coming up. This is a space resource. The sun is in space. It shines down, giving all warmth, heat and light to life on Earth. This is the fundamental resource for life on Earth. And when we think about informal settlements, when we think about refugee camps, when we think about city centers, when we think about the average life of a South African power, obviously plays quite a big role. Also, when we are thinking about setting camp up camp beyond Earth. Water, the next, I would argue, most fundamental resource for life. And in fact, we believe that much of the water in our ocean, 70% of the surface, was delivered to Earth by asteroids and comets. So again, a space resource, water, probably had a life before our sun. Um, we do think much of our oceans are older than our sun. So think about that the next time you're in the sea, that these oceans were once bathed in the light of a foreign star that could be really far away from the one um, that keeps us alive now. You know, what is the most important discovery of the space exploration program, I would argue, is that life on Earth is unique. There is no other planet in the solar system where we can see life from space. There may be fossilized evidence of life, microbial life under the surface on Mars, yes, but we cannot see it from space nor through the rovers that we've sent there. So it's elusive. On Earth, life is abundant. These photosynthetic belts provide temperature regulation, oxygen production, food, fossil fuel, you name it. This is really the bedrock of life on Earth are the other species and organisms that we share this planet with. 
Um, and the fundamental category of data, I think we can't ignore now. Access to the internet is no longer a luxury, it's a fundamental part of being able to play a meaningful role in society. And if we think as humans we got there first creating data, you know, again, we would have to admit that nature got there first, and this molecule that transfers information from parents to offspring um, is exactly that, an encoder of information that pre-existed even humans and that all life on Earth shares in common. So that's beautiful, you know, these fundamental concepts of shelter, then power, water, food, and data um, underpin thinking about human communities in whatever context we may be doing that. Um, and a lot of space exploration has been focused around answering that question, where do we come from, are we alone in the universe? Um, and arguably, you know, the smartphone that, that we all in this room have and that many humans on the planet now do have was enabled by the, um, the making smaller and the making more efficient and the basically developments in technology that were driven by space programs to the extent that we can have beautiful images like this and the footage that I'll show you in a minute being taken on the surface of Mars has enabled you know, the miniaturization of devices that we, we enjoy ourselves. Um, but yes, I've said there's this uh, contrast between Mars being within reach. You know, NASA's landed there successfully nine times. The next step is to pressurize that uh, spaceship taking technology there and put humans inside. It's within reach. We have the technological capability to do it. But at the same time, our life support system on Earth is under threat. The biggest, uh, perhaps, uh, challenge there is the climate change that we know is happening. And uh, I'll show this dramatic picture of Earth with no water. But let's remember, climates always change. And if we look at Venus, our next-door neighbor planet, if we look at Mars, our other next-door neighbor planet, both of these planets once hosted liquid water on the surface billions of years ago. So, climate can change radically, in fact, it does, but how will we manage that change? And in the midst of a changing climate, in the midst of a growing population, pandemics are predicted. <laughs> uh, increased I almost couple water and air in the same bundle because oxygen can be extracted from H2O. Um, but the way that we purify, uh, let's say, urine to drinkable water in the space station has already provided the inspiration for many household-based or even small community-based water filtration systems um, that we hadn't thought of before we had this challenge of how the astronauts in the space station would have access to what is really quite a heavy resource to keep launching from Earth. And in the food category, so first in 1982, um, this beautiful flower blossomed in the International Space Station, but actually vertical farming, which has now become quite a, a trend, was only proposed in 99, I believe. So way before we were thinking about growing food in confined spaces because of urbanization, because of whatever reasons, we were already meeting the challenge of growing food in foreign environments like the space station um, uh, and how that can assist with providing food for more people with less resources. Um, so to switch to a kind of different example of how space exploration drives innovation, the South African Radio Astronomy Organization in 2020 produced 20,000 ventilators because they housed the engineers that work on the Square Kilometre Array radio telescope, the most sort of challenging and largest collaboration um, in the science world at the moment, building the telescope in the Northern Cape amongst other locations. So these engineers repurposed their skills and produced 20,000 ventilators, looking at the sort of system design as well as the physical hardware design of these things in light of the obviously the pandemic that was the case in 2020. Um, the Indian Space Agency you know, sent the cheapest space mission to Mars that's ever been implemented. At $100 million, they managed to, in the first attempt, put an orbital mission in orbit around Mars. And let's just by comparison, the movie Gravity, maybe some of you remember that, George Clooney and Sandra Bullock, the same year, this was 2017, I think, cost the same amount of money. So Hollywood made a movie about space for $100 million. India sent a mission to Mars for the same price tag, um, proving to the developing world that space can be done within the context and within the restrictions or restraints, constraints of being in a developing country. And using the satellite technology that they launched to Mars, they implemented telemedicine and remote education programs throughout, obviously, the large space that is India, enabling uh, specialized individuals to provide healthcare to people in remote areas, as well as people to deliver lectures, education, etc., using satellite networks. So, those are just a few examples. Um, 
of how technology, how the technologies we've developed for space can help to alleviate the challenges we're facing here on Earth. And that's just currently existing stuff. I think if we are, and hopefully in our lifetime this happens, to set up camp on the surface of Mars, we can't even imagine, literally, the kind of developments that will come out of that mission because of being in a new and extreme place that will naturally have a knock-on and trickle-down effect here on Earth. So, where is this? Um, and this is an example of how technology has, you know, mind-blowingly developed in the past few years. Okay, that gives it away, if you know the Curiosity rover and Gale Crater being a location on Mars. But look at the resolution of this footage. To think that we have technology 200 million kilometers away on the surface of our next-door neighbor planet, sending back detailed information, which is really transforming the way we think. You know, being able to imagine what the surface of another planet looks like through looking at footage like this actually transforms the global human psyche in some sense. Even the word global wouldn't be around unless we had satellites to take pictures of Earth to show that it's a globe. Flat Earth societies aside for now. Um, but let me skip to the next video and, okay, I was going to say, guess where this is. Um, <laughs> but look at the striking similarities between a really beautiful part of Southern Africa, namely our, our next door neighbor country, Namibia, um, and the conditions on the surface of Mars. So how do you justify expending your time and energy and resources and space exploration when you are living in Southern Africa? And a simple answer to that, I think, is water management. Water management. So the striking similarities between the surface of Mars and uh, the Namib Desert in our next door neighbor country, Namibia, make it an ideal place to run our off-world experiments, which we had a call for applications for in the, in the previous um, uh, video I showed. So basically, a team of experts will arrive in a completely remote area in the Namib Nalkluft Desert, set up camp from scratch, including, you know, by now, shelter power, water, food, and comm systems, live there as a research community, and then pack up camp, because it is a national reserve after all, um, and come back and analyze the data broadcast the experience to a global audience as a documentary series, and hopefully inspire the next generation of young people to get excited about exploring, to get excited about learning science and being curious and asking the big questions. So like I said, water management is at the heart when we are in a water-constrained environment like a desert or Mars. And as climate change impacts communities, you know, let's ask the people in Cape Town about droughts. Let's ask the people in Durban about floods. Let's ask people in Joburg about failing infrastructure. Um, water management is going to be even more critical, perhaps, than power management in the coming decades, I believe. So, I've had to reflect, you know, living down there in the forest with one bar of signal and not even scrolling through social media as much as I would have liked to. I did have the opportunity to self-reflect and think about, you know, I've claimed that the knock-on effect of exploring in space has already and will continue to, you know, boost innovation on Earth, which can result in the alleviation of the resource constraints, namely poverty, that so many people on Earth live in. But is that good enough? And so, Instead of waiting for my dream to explore beyond Earth to have that knock-on effect, I'm switching it around and saying, I need to demonstrate how the systems that we want to develop for off-world exploration and living, perhaps one day, we need to first demonstrate that on Earth. And at the same time, bring tens of thousands of children on board by being part of a space exploration program. So having an atmospheric water extractor in a school can mean thousands of pure H2O being extracted out of the atmosphere in a condition like KZN, for example, where households, companies, schools, etc., may have been without water. Um, the AgriLab, where we, the students and the scholars can choose what seeds they want to grow, is another opportunity for us to collect data on how we can produce food quickly and easily, like which school project grew the most nutrition in the shortest space of time. Just having a solar array there to, to set up all of that equipment will enable the school to also have power for internet, which will also be a necessary part of our system in order to do the IoT data collection that we plan. The school will now also have that knock knock-on effect of having that communication system that's powered by renewable energy. So, I'm standing up here in public because I am serious about raising the money for 100 schools in Southern Africa, which could have as much as 1,000 kids in each school, having the opportunity to be part of a space program. And by a knock-on effect, having clean water, reliable power, and a communication system that can assist them to learn. 
So, this is a beautiful quote by a Canadian philosopher, and I think to remind you again, we're on a spaceship, it's traveling at 100,000 kilometers an hour around a star that we call the sun. We're in space, um, and uh, we are not just the crew here, we have an active role to play. And so, to summarize, I'm not sure if your pivot or your um, journey as a SMME in this period involves you know, building a cabin in a remote forest valley, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure whether it will involve you like photoshopping your face onto Elon Musk's car and imagine zooting around the solar system. But I think with respect to that quote about us all being crew, how are we going to contribute towards that better world that we are all hoping for? And I think competitiveness is not enough anymore. We have to move away from competitiveness. And we have to lead with collaboration. We have to lead with cooperation. We have to lead with uh, creativity, curiosity, okay, all of these things are turning out to have Cs. But I think collaboration and most importantly, compassion. You know, if what you are striving towards in your business model or in your life um, does not impact enough of the people around you who are living in, you know, conditions that are, are not uh, of a level that we can be proud of, you know, then you have to do more. You have to have compassion first, I think. That would be my closing uh, message in terms of how we do business differently in 2022. You know, what the pandemic has taught us is that no one is immune, no matter how much money you have or how much infrastructure or how high your wall is, no one is immune from pandemics, no one is immune from power, uh, unreliability, and no one will be immune from water shortages, food shortages. So we have now to decide to be more collaborative, more cooperative, and more compassionate, I think, as we go forward into 2022. And through that, I believe it is absolutely feasible that we do create a proudly human future, a future that we can be proud of, no matter what planet we're on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doc. That was incredible. Absolutely incredible. What a beautiful morning. I just want to thank everyone who came through in attendance. I want to thank all of our speakers, from Bronwyn to Dr. Adriana to uh, our panelists, Ari, Zandile, Moshima, and even Tumelo for uh, hosting that for us. Thank you guys for tuning in. It's been such an insightful mo uh, morning in general. And I think what, uh, what you want to take away from a lot of this is what's next. You know, what's next is all that matters, as that other station always says to us. What's next is all that matters, man. Listen, the conversation and the, the morning is not over please continue to engage with us on social media make sure you use the hashtag standard bank sme summit that's where you can get a lot of this stuff share this link share all of this information with your friends and family because as we know it's always drilled into our heads that smes are the backbone of this economy and it's so true not just here but across the world that smes are really the backbone of our economy i want to thank you one more time for being here with us and if you're ever wondering if it's ever possible for you to get there and do better remember with Standard Bank, it can be. Cheers. <laughs>